Um, it's it, the, the whole idea, and, and, and this is how it's sort of evolved, it's all about consistent feedback, um, which we can now do with technology in a much greater sense than we've ever been able to do before, even when I wrote it. Um, and, and then just allowing people the room to learn, which is a, a cultural thing more than anything. Um, but it requires a completely different mindset by not just the L&D department, but the entire organization. It's not just a different set of tools. That, that for me was those, one of the sort of radical uh, thoughts that certainly that I clicked for the first time around that was, was um, you know, this notion that um, L&D is everybody's job, right? Yeah. Um, and and the, the learning organization is not a small training group inside the company. It's in the entire company. And, you know, I, I personally got to go through that experience at, at, at at Microsoft, as we experimented with that idea, and really very much led by by our CEO, um, very 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 cool. Yeah. Um, you, you've spoken about the importance of convergence um, on increasing connection or the interconnection between people's career, uh, their learning at work, and their performance. Can you explain your thinking on that? Yeah, well, it turns out it's really difficult to train somebody unless you know where they want to go and how they're currently performing. Um, I think in the early days, we separated those three things out mostly because we weren't interested in the individual um, or the future. We were just interested in upping the, the efficiency numbers. Um, but now as those those things have started coming together, we're seeing these, these really smart people leaders start talking to each other and um, having one conversation instead of three. Um, and this is manifesting, like a good example of this is putting pressure on the managers now to have regular career and development discussions with individuals. And we're seeing this in the organizations, but we're also seeing it in the technology that supports them. Um, technologies are bridging the performance and learning and career gap and creating tools so that all three of those things work really well together. Um, and, and so it's become more of a conversation about what the company can do to support the person in their performance and their career goals and give them the learning opportunities they need to get there. It's one conversation, not three. Got it. Got it. Got it. And then um, a lot of this is a focused on, um, you and I talked a little bit about this before, this, I've been thinking a lot about the the focus on the individual, personalization yeah. and adaptive technologies and empowering, in inverted commas, individuals to take charge of their own learning when a lot of the trends around uh, workplace technologies are increasingly collaborative and collaborations and uh, working in teams. Do you see those things at odds or is it just a, a different uh, we, we need to make sure we cover both bases. I think we just need to cover both bases. Um, I think both of them are necessary for learning. If you look at the the science behind learning, obviously you don't just learn in a classroom. You learn with every interaction that you have. And so figuring out how to, how to make your environment support both of those things, I think, is the key. Great. Very interesting stuff. So a couple of... Uh, Opportunities that you and I have had to work together. One, one uh, I had the opportunity to work with you at the at the D School at Stanford, where you presented your work on humanizing learning. And again, that reports on your website, Central Read, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think essentially you did the sort of lit review or research review on on what separate separates the Homo sapiens from other species, and maybe even more importantly, from from the robots. Um, what was your prompt for that work, and, and what did you discover? Yeah, I had read one too many articles. Most of, <laughs> most of my really good research comes out of ire, apparently. But I had read one too many articles on how the robots were coming for our jobs. And there's actually even a website out there. I don't know if you've been there, but it's called oh, willowtakemyjob.com yeah. or whatever. Um, and it'll tell you the, the, the probability that a robot will come in and take your job. I had just read enough of those where I was like, wait a second. There's a reason that we have had a success as we have as a species. And so what are those things that separate us from the apes and from the robots? And what are the things that we should be giving back to the robots to do versus what are the things that we should be leveraging our humans to do? Um, it really a very very cool uh, kind of prompt. I've done my own lit review, starting with Mary Shelley, and it turns <laughs> out whenever we get anxious about technology, um, we robots and monsters uh, are the sort of embodiment of that. So it's actually you know this 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 notion of robots taking our jobs is actually not new at all. It's a recurring theme um, in 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 literature. Um, what what were the uh, you came up with four things? I don't want to give away the punchline but um can you share with us this the things that you 
you found in the research that really did separate us from um, other species? Yeah, let's see if I can remember him. Um, the, the well, first I, I can remember one. Oh, you've got him in front of you? Great. I, I, I haven't got him in front of me. I, I, I just read the research. And okay. I, I remember the first one uh, that I remember is that um, the ability to envisage a different future. Uh, so it turns out, yeah, it turns out that we've not, there are no species that think toward the future. They're, they're worried about surviving now. Um, but, but humans actually envision a different future and can take steps in order to, to make that future a reality. And totally. they well, Go ahead. Yeah, totally logical. I think um, uh, the second one that I remember is um, the ability, so altruism, essentially, the ability yeah. to collaborate um, even beyond when it's in your interest to do that. Yeah, um, apes don't do that either, and neither do robots. And so um, the ability to collaborate, humans have a natural ability and desire to collaborate. Think about how often you help somebody that <laughs> you'll, never, you'll never see anything come from it, but, but you're helping them because that's, that's what humans do. Um, and that separates us from, from, from the apes and from the robots. Robots also don't collaborate. Very cool. And the two more. Yeah, one was storytelling. Um, Very we, powerful. We are able to, yeah, transfer information through stories and motivate in ways that robots and other animals do not. And then the final one was the use of technology. And there's lots of research out there that says, you know, there are some species, a crow, for example, that can assemble a small tool to do something. Um, but we use technology not just to change our physical spaces, but to change our mental spaces. So just the fact that somebody is listening to this podcast um, indicates that they're using a tool or a technology in order to in order to better their mind or to change their mind about something, which is something other animals don't do and robots will never do. And uh, yeah, certainly in a way, stories are, are tools as well. Uh, I, I like that a lot. It made me think of the Noel Havrati's book, Sapiens, where you know he just talks about the power of of a concept. It, it allows us to operate in, at, at much bigger scale than 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 our nearest rivals, the chimps, right? Who I think are constrained to packs of 30 or 40 individuals yeah very yeah. interesting stuff definitely and then you go on to talk about how that's kind of relevant and how we can um use that to make our kind of learning cultures better um one other time that you and i had a chance to work was with the international federation of red cross red crescent last year in geneva um where we took about 30 chief learning officers from very very large fortune 500 companies uh, to the Federation's headquarters, which uh, beautifully was on the roof of the IKEA in downtown Geneva. Um, and we had a great week and we helped orchestrate that knowledge exchange. For me, the results were really profound. <laughs> in, in, in some respects, the opposite of what, what everyone expected. There, there was really a lot learned that week, I think. Um, but one of the things that I remember from that was this notion, uh, I think you came up with, that said, you know, we're all volunteers. We learned from observing and understanding how the Red Cross and its 11 million volunteers around the world kind of operates and say so that's a really useful metaphor and idea for how we can approach um, engaging with, with, our, with our workers, right? If we pay the, whether we pay them or not, they're essentially volunteers. Um, can you share some of your observations from that week? Yeah, I mean, I think that one really hit me hard. Um, the the volunteer thing, like we're solving the same problem. It's just in a little bit different context. So, and I don't think I was the original author of that, but I've, I've certainly latched onto it. So that was one. The other one is I've been doing this ongoing project with uh, the Red Cross and I'll probably get a little sappy here, but um, I had the chance before the CLOs came in, I had a chance to stand in a room with um, all of the learning leaders for the Red Cross across the world. And there were countries in there that didn't speak English. And there were also countries in there that, um, we were at war with and other countries were at war with and there was yeah. just this incredible group of learning leaders sitting in a room collaborating as much as they possibly could to make sure that those 11 million volunteers and the people that support them had the, the opportunities for learning that they needed. It was it was pretty amazing. And everything that you say in your report about what makes us human was kind of writ large that week, wasn't it? For sure. Yeah, it was a very, very cool week. Um, uh, well, um, while I have you on sort of the emotional uh, high here, um, we, we like to ask our guests sort of finally if they can share some inspiration or a personal perspective. You know, I've found over the years that people work in this, who work in this space, talent, uh, leadership and, and learning, um, whether it's in K through 12 or in the workplace, sort of feel like it's, there's something special about the work, helping people get better at what they do. 
um, or helping them create new futures for themselves. Um, can you talk about your relationship with learning and teaching? Was there a time or a person or a specific experience that inspired you to follow your work path? I mean, I think so. Um, from the time I was a little kid, my mom was always doing things that she didn't know how to do. So she'd read a book and then do it. And we <laughs> couches and, and sewed and did the gardening and, you know, all kinds of construction projects that she just didn't know how to do. And so I think from the time I was a little kid, it was just ingrained in me that if you don't know how to do it, you just go out and learn it. It's not something that will stop you. And she was also very careful, careful with the phrase, I can't. It was never not corrected in our house. Like you don't ever say I can't because you always can. And so I think that sort of gave me like this insatiable curiosity that has led to the career that I have, um, which I'm actually really grateful for. Yeah, well, I can tell you, you your your curiosity is writ large on your work. I know uh, you approach things with with that sort of, with that curiosity and, and that sort of can do, uh, we can solve it kind of attitude, which is great. So um, it's time. We're at time. Uh, and I really want to thank you for uh, sharing what you do with the uh, Learning Futures audience. Um, thanks for your body of work, Danny, and uh, sharing your insights today. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to uh, one more time let people know where they can learn more about your work and, and get engaged. Yeah, redthreadresearch.com. All one word, red thread All research. one word, red, red thread research dot com. Great. Um, and uh, do you have a social media presence, or is that just where we send people? Yes. No. Yeah. Also, I'm pretty visible on LinkedIn. So if you uh, if you want to hit me up there, if you have questions or comments or really good data for me, give me give me, reach out. Data, 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 data. Feed me. <laughs> okay, Danny. Well, thanks a lot. Um, uh, have a great rest of the day, and uh, really appreciate your, your insights. Um, thank you. It was my pleasure. I thought the future would be cooler. Hey, thanks for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this edition of Learning is the New Working. We're committed to this being a useful resource for you, so please email me at chris at learningfuturesgroup.com if you have any questions about anything we've discussed today. If you have the time, please take a few minutes to rate us on the podcast platform where you found us. It really helps other listeners find us and get value from the show. Finally, do please check out our friends at Intrepid Learning. They sponsored this particular episode. Uh, they have a collaborative learning platform that empowers companies to solve high-stakes business challenges through engaging and applied learning at scale. We love it. Uh, Intrepid's approach helps individuals learn and improve and organizations transform and grow. And it's helped customers increase sales, reduce new, higher time to impact, increase the speed and success of strategic change initiatives, and improve employee engagement while reducing costs and much, much more. So do check them out at intrepidlearning.com. And we'll see you next time to help make the future of workplace learning as cool as it absolutely should be.